Hi, and welcome to another episode of Arsenal Pass Limited Time Only, the heavy hitter season. Um, last time we talked about the format in general, and I graded some generics. And this one is the brute episode where I'll discuss how to draft KO and how to draft Reinar. Let's go. Now, the first thing you want to notice about brute is that it is the only class that's on rate in heavy hitters, kind of as a standard. You have three cost attacks that attack for seven and block for three, and usually have a kind of a bonus on top. Two cost attacks that attack for six and block for three, or then you have a couple two two cost attacks that attack for six, but have a big bonus, like a, a go again or a plus two attack. So how does this compare to the other classes? Well, Guardian basically has minus one attack on all of their commons. So all the commons got basically shaved one off the top. Um, so without any tokens, a Guardian common hits three for six or five for eight or something like that. And of course, that's that's on purpose because then Guardian usually has the best late game because the pitch stack uh, naturally contains these six attacks and, and, and five attacks and so on. But I think that's a very interesting choice in heavy hitters. Uh, because Guardian is usually the one, Guardian is the one you're used to being sort of always on rate, always blocking for three, always attacking for seven if you if it costs three, etc. So so it's a, it's a very interesting choice and it, it makes the format quite dynamic in many ways. Um, so that's Guardian and Warrior then, they mainly have one for threes that sort of become on rate when you block them with attack so maybe they they generate a token if you block them block them with an attack uh or if you block the saber with an attack it gets a gets a pump and so on so but even even if you have an agility token so let's say you start the turn with an agility token you have a one for three pump and a blue in hand that's that means you're attacking for five plus two so that's a that's a two card seven so you need the agility token to just be on rate with two cards. If you don't have the agility, you're attacking for for uh, you know a two card five, which is miserable. Um, but what Ko and Reinar are doing is that if they have two cards, they're attacking quite often for seven. Sometimes you know if you have a have a bear fangs, you're actually attacking for eight plus one might token for the next turn. With KO. So not only are you on rate most of the time, but you can with some cards relatively easily get above rate. So so that's sort of the value angle of of um brute. And that's also why you see KO, you know, in this chart down toward the bottom where where it wins with value. Reiner can kind of do both. Reiner can win with value. It's, it can do the same thing that Chaos doing, but it's lacking the plus one from the might token on most turns. So it generates far less excess value per game. And on the other hand, it can win with evasion. It has the intimidate um, sort of more easily available, and it can finish the game with a big bone breaker bellow claw claw attack turn or something like that or a, or a trade in claw claw attack turn um, where you can get intimidates in and, and, and still push you know 10 plus damage and, and make it very hard to block so reinar in this chart this does kind of in the middle of the y-axis it, it can do both but neither one as well as maybe others and um, then on the on the x-axis it's sort of in the middle ish as well because it doesn't have access to wild ride similarly as, as KO does. So it cannot as easily use a big hand if it doesn't have an agility token. Of course, it, it can more freely play pumps. So you can play bone breaker bellows, you can play lead with powers, etc. a little bit easier, which means that you know in a build like that, you kind of start creeping toward the left. Whereas KO is at the bottom, it's it's generating a lot of value on a turn by turn basis. Um, because of the ability to create the might token and the fact that the, the cards are on rate and you know in, in case of bear fangs or wild ride you know it's it's sort of above rate as well when it hits so it has an easier time generating value and it because of wild ride it probably has a slightly easier time using big hands as well 
but not maybe as easy as the warriors do because it cannot just sort of you know uh, pile up all of its pumps into one attack and and that's it next let's talk about the target equipment that you want with these heroes so it's quite similar for ko and reinar uh where of course the the specialization hat the headpiece differs um but other than that you mostly want the same pieces so you always want flat trackers it's it's, uh, in my mind, very much a bomb in this format. And I'm very, very happy first picking this card. As, you know, it's, it might even be a little bit better, you know, slightly, maybe not even a great grade's worth, but a slightly bit better in KO because not only does it give you the agility, it very, very easily enables raw meat because you might have generated the might on your own much easier. Uh, but that's a, that's a very tiny, tiny upgrade. Um, so you always want flat trackers. Um, overcome adversity is a fine, uh, fine replacement, uh, especially if you're more controlling with your build. But uh, but flat trackers, I, I still think is much much better. You always want raw meat, or almost always. I guess there are situations with Reinar when you would, you know, want the uh, uh, adversity piece, uh, confront adversity. I think in certain matchups against like Olympia or someone who, who generates a lot of vigor. But with with KO raw meat is also a a bomb. It's like an A minus. It's so so easy to turn it on at least once per game, and quite easy to turn it on twice per game because you have agile wind ups, you have flat trackers, you know any any agility creator together with your your uh, hero ability turns it on. So so it's really really strong in in KO. It's quite strong in Reinar as well, but but I put it at a full grade lower because it's um much more difficult to line it up so that you get both both tokens on the same turn unless you have smashback ale horns then in the arm slot you want gauntlet of might for ko it's maybe not that important because you generate might anyway and there's no bonus for for bigger attack on your on your cards like for guardian so embrace adversity can kind of be equally fine in those two matchups where it where it matters but Reinar really wants Gauntlet of Might as well because then you can then you can turn on your raw meat a, a lot easier. And the headpieces, Knucklehead, it's a temper two block, ninety five percent of the time, and that's what you want it to be. It's a it's an A. It's insane. Just blocking three with your with your hat unconditionally, mind you, in this format is is insanely strong. The ability you can maybe use if you're like far behind and it's your only out to win the game then go ahead and, and pop it and hope for a six but um it's pretty bad value to to pop it for the intelligence uh, monsters fail uh this one i'm unsure of so take the take the b with a grain of salt but this is mostly a theory crafting idea that it's not nearly as strong as knucklehead you get you get one block out of it and then you can use the ability when you want but the random discard with a deck that doesn't get to 20 plus sixes very easily because none of the blues in the set are sixes so it's a very risky proposition to go for that random discard and you need to kind of manufacture it in a way where it's beneficial for you so maybe you get to play your bone breaker bellow first so you get to pitch your blue and you have a couple floating so you don't at least lose the blue or or, or other things like that but um it can be strong and it can be a you know really big benefit on the finisher turn, give you an extra intimidate and so on. But uh, but just having two block less than knucklehead pulls it down at least a, a full grade for me. Next, let's talk about KO. Um, how do you draft KO? What are the benefits? What are the downsides? How do you end up on the deck? What are the top commons and rares? What are kind of the target decks you want to end up on? What are the different builds? Um, so I will be now focusing on KO only. Um, so let's start with the start with the benefits. So what what's what's KO really about? What is KO trying to do? KO is is a you know a four intellect twenty health hero as every other hero in the set with one weapon zone. Uh, it says attack action cards you own get plus one while they are in any zone other than the combat chain. And the first time you discard a card with six or more attack during each of your action phases, create a might token. So what does that mean? Well, the first ability, the wep one weapon zone ability, we'll, we'll come back to that on the next page. Um, but the, the two others, 
what they enable is that first of all 60 which is toward the low end in draft i would say up to all the way to 90 percent of your deck can be sort of six power attacks quote unquote you know six up power it's it, they're five powers but they they count as six powers and then the second ability it gives you a might token several times during the game i haven't really done the math but i'm guessing it's somewhere around like 50 percent of your turns probably generate the might token out of this which is huge in like a six turn game you're you've generated three extra value which is a full card of value with that second ability alone and, and then you have the first ability to make your make your hero more consistent as well and why are you making your hero more consistent why are you making your deck full of sixes um this is not the constructed reinar deck which has a lot of random discard uh in it but you have two key cards while you're doing this it's bear fangs and it's wild ride these are two cost six attack in red no blocks where bear fangs draws and discards a card and if you discard a six um it gets plus two and wild ride the same thing but it gets go again instead of the plus two so in order to minimize the the whiffs in your deck the the miss possibilities you want to fill your deck with sixes because then you can grab all the bear fangs and wild rides you need and happily just you know play these above rate cards that also by the way give you the might token um so they are above above rate basically um so these are the two key cards why you are filling your deck with sixes in addition to this what you want to draft is a lot of agility creation because without agility or specifically a wild ride you have a very tough time using a five card hand or even a four card hand efficiently cards like bone breaker bellow help and cards like assault and battery kind of help where you can you can beat chest and, and, and get uh, get the extra bit of value from that but um generally your best turn starts with an agility token because then you can attack twice with a with a big attack maybe even put in a claw in the middle if you've discarded something do you want a lot of agility you want blue five attacks especially three blocks and and why is this well it's quite easy you'll notice when you're drafting to fill your deck with red and yellow five or six attacks it's not a huge undertaking to do that but with your blues you need to be really careful because if you get towards the end of pack two and you notice that hey i only have like four blues or five blues that i drafted i need like you know i want like seven more optimally or something like that it's going to get much harder so already from very early on in the draft you need to prioritize blue five attacks and if they're three blocks then then they do everything for you they are super crazy flexible cards where they block three they pitch for three and they count as a six in your deck and by the way when you get to your pitch stacks they still attack for five so they they are really really strong and the difference between these blue five attacks and blue other cards especially if they're two blocks so let's say a blue five attack and a blue adrenaline rush the difference is much much bigger in ko than in any, any other deck basically so that's why you want to be prioritizing those five attack blues so highly you also want key armor pieces as you noticed on the uh, on the earlier page the the most important armor pieces flat trackers um raw meat and knucklehead if you're lucky enough to get it they are you know bombs in the deck very much so so you want to be prioritizing those as well once you know your especially once you know a ko but of course you know a card like flat trackers you you want to early pick anyway and then you want a mix of two for sixes or three for sevens depending on the build and what, I, what do i mean by depending on the build well you can draft ko in a couple different ways you can opt for the the bear fangs wild ride super aggressive build which maximizes agility makes sure that you generate a lot of agility tokens you come in for two or three big attacks or two two big attacks and maybe a claw in some turns on on top uh every turn and thus you are sort of short to medium turn outvaluing the opponent 
because they have a lot of two blocks in their hand because of this format. And if you come in for, you know, 10 plus 14 plus 12 plus 16, then they're going to have a really, really bad time and the game is going to be over in four turns. Um, so that's kind of one deck, but that is very, very reliant on lining up your agilities and wild rides and, and, and other um, cards that enable you to efficiently use your big hands. And if they don't line up, you might be in trouble because you're you're stuck with these non-blocks in your hand. So the other build you can you can try to go for KO is, is that you rely more on the fact that, hey, I'm a brute with a really good set of abilities. I'm going to be on rate and my opponents are going to be below rate. So I'm just going to uh, build it with a lot of three for sevens, with a lot of block threes, and just outvalue and eventually fatigue my opponent. So what are the downsides of of um, drafting KO? Well, first of all, of course, the obvious noticeable one is that you have one weapon zone, which means there are no Reinar-like plays where you go, uh, you know, discard a, a mighty windup or an agile windup. You go claw claw into attack, or you play trade in, discard a card, draw a card. You go claw claw and, and, and attack. So there are none of these fancy claw claw plays, uh, which are of course very valuable and enable you to go very wide. Um, you also have very restricted slots for non-5 attack cards in most builds. So you need to be very careful when you're drafting that you're not just, you know, happily picking cards here and there looking at the, you know, how how nice and shiny these these uh block cards and and these instants and and these bone breaker bellows and all of these are and then then you end up with a deck that has, you know, 15 sixes and and 15 other cards and suddenly your wild rides and and bear fangs become a huge liability. Especially wild rides. Of course, bear fangs is a two for six, so that's not the end of the world if you miss. But if you miss a wild ride when you're dependent on it, then then you can lose the game on the spot. So it makes your drafting uh, very specific, where you need to constantly keep in mind that almost every card you pick is a is a five attack. Also, uh, KO has very little evasion beyond burst damage. So you have pack hunt and you have rawhide rumble in theory but that you know is very very rarely online so the way you finish games is by outvaluing the opponent either long term or or short term by by hitting them for 17 or something and then they're just dead on the spot next let's look at ko's optimal hands and play patterns um how do the turns how do the let's say strong turns that you're aiming for how do they actually play out so let's imagine here that your hand is is a uh, bear fangs red, a pack hunt red, and then two blues. Let's say a three block blue and a two block blue, for example. Uh, I put in assault and battery and agile wind up here as the blues, uh, just to kind of get you in the mindset of of the kind of cards you want to be drafting. Um, but here it doesn't exactly matter for this scenario which ones they are. And then you have a wild ride in arsenal, and maybe you park that wild ride in arsenal on a previous turn. Um, specifically for the purpose that when you don't have an agility at the start of your turn, wild ride becomes extremely strong. It's kind of your agility in insurance waiting there in Arsenal, where you can still use your big hand if you had tempo uh, very efficiently with the wild ride. But then if you have the agility, maybe you don't need the wild ride. Maybe you can wait for a future turn um, when you don't have it and, and keep it keep it as insurance there. So what do you do with this? you know, fantastic looking five card hand. Well, if you have the agility, you can come in for a four card 17 plus one from the from the might token with bear fangs, mandible claw, pack hunt, for example. Of course, you, you had to get pretty lucky with your discard. So you basically had to discard the card that you drew. Or if you don't have an agility token, you can start with the wild ride and then follow it up with a claw and a two cost attack from bear fangs or pack, pack hunt, whichever you're left with. And of course, you can very easily see that there's inherent risk built in this. That if you discard the wrong card, you can be in a bit of trouble. And how much trouble is that? Well, of course, if you play wild ride and you draw and discard a bone breaker bellow, then you're screwed, right? Then your turn is over and 
you've basically given yourself a you know a double intellect penalty um that's that's the absolute worst case so that's kind of coming back to the point where you want to you know if you have a lot of wild rides and bear fangs you want to be drafting your your deck full of these sixes or fives so that's the worst case scenario the second worst case scenario probably is that you you discard a blue and what that means is that you missed a claw swing then you just have to um pitch whatever you drew to come in for the the pack hunt or the bear fangs depending on the the scenario so you basically miss three damage if you if you discard the blue and draw a red or a, or a yellow instead so not optimal but uh still pretty strong to come in for a four card 15 basically if it's bear fangs and pack hunt plus the might token that's the the upside you know you have these big hands where you can come in for four cards 17s 18s if you count the might token etc um or then you can choose to go another way right you can if you have to defend which you quite often have to do if they're wagering something for example um or just your life total is at a point where you can't take their full 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 hand um with this hand you can of course just block for six with pack hunt and assault and battery and come in for for eight plus one or six with the bear fangs depending on if you hit or not but if you know you've built your deck right and if most often you hit then it's still you know eight plus one plus the six you defended with um so that's an you know 13 value of, of of a four card hand still or 15. is that 15 that's 15. um so <laughs> that's that's pretty crazy um off a four card hand where you had to defend with two cards so that shows you the the absolute strength of of bear fangs as a card and, and also shows you my poor math um so that's kind of the versatility of the deck and it swings then both ways right so you can you can go more for the wild rides and the bear fangs and have more of the upside but then you don't get to choose when you block and what you block with as easily or you can swing swing the way of the the three blocks um but then you're probably you have probably haven't drafted as many of these wild rides and bear fangs and and um you might have a bit of trouble generating sort of above rate value so what does all of this mean for what you actually want to be drafting as ko let's look at the top commons and rares starting from the bombs the a's to the b pluses and moving on to the b's and b minuses um that you really want to be filling your deck with in addition to you know getting uh some of these some of these on the left so let's start uh with the a's to b pluses first of all the equipment um these you already noticed were all super super important for ko knucklehead block for three really really strong flat trackers um you can kind of choose when to pop it when you otherwise wouldn't wouldn't generate an agility or when you when you're not arsenaling a, a wild ride or something like that um really important piece to keep that aggression going and then raw meat is uh quite often another block three kind of like knucklehead uh although a little bit more conditional so and and you don't get to choose the exact turn when you use it so that's the that's the downside of it but still super super strong um then you have bear fangs red and wild ride red these we already talked about and then you have two cards that may be surprising to some and probably not so much to others so lead with speed red this is for many people this is uh one of the first pickable cards in the set anyway it, it goes so well into all of the all of the four decks it fits um and what it does in ko specifically it, that is that it enables two consecutive turns when you can kind of ensure that you are somewhat efficiently at least using a big hand because on the first turn you play this you play a, a big attack then that's at least let's say a three card nine right then maybe you arsenal one card so you've been able to use four cards relatively efficiently even without the agility token of course with the agility you can you can also put in a claw swing in there for example and then on your next turn you'll have an agility token which ensures that again next turn you'll be quite well using your big hand so you can keep the tempo going and why you why do you want to be using these big hands because attacking for two big attacks or or one huge attack every turn means that 
they can not only block with their, the cards they're happy blocking with, the block threes that they might have in their hand, but they, at some point, you know, two, three turns of this, and they have to start blocking with the block twos. And that's when you lose in this format, is when you start losing value by having to block with your block twos. Then you have Agile wind up blue. So first of all, of course, this is super flexible. It's a, it's a blue, that's a six attack in your deck, but the ability is also insane. Um, it's not like generating gigantic value necessarily, but it's, it's combined with the flexibility that it's insane. Because if you discard the Agile wind up on your turn, you create an agility token and you create a might token and you give your claw go again. So you can discard the, the wind up, attack with claw, attack with something else. You'll start your next turn with an agility and a might. And by the way, your raw meat is fully turned on at the same time by discarding this one card. So it does everything you want it to do. It's very, very flexible. The only thing it's missing is a, is a block three, but that, that you can live with because of the, the rest of the flexibility. Then you have the Bs to B minuses. So these are the cards you actively want to seek um, as much as possible in your deck because not you know, you don't always find the A's and the B pluses, right? Um, so these are cards like Assault and Battery Red. It's a three block, three for seven, super efficient. And if you're stuck with an extra card in hand, it gives you an agility and a might token. So it turns that extra card into plus one from the might. And you could say quite often plus two or something like that from the agility, depending on how well you, your hand works on the offense versus defense, because many of your cards might block block worse than, than they uh, they attack. So you probably get a couple of points of value from the agility quite often. So it can actually sort of salvage full value from that extra card you had. And again, alone, this uh, enables raw meat to block for two. You have wage agility, really, really strong as a, as a three for seven, where if you pick the right spot, they don't have the equipment online or something like that. You can quite often wager this, and it becomes a very uncomfortable wager for them. Even if they have the equipment online, you know, in case they're not the warrior, it's very hard for them with that two or three card hand to to necessarily use the agility very efficiently. Um, so super strong. Clash of Agility, red. Um, it's a two for six that blocks for three, which is already pretty nice in the deck because you're absolute strongest turns are, are turns where you go like wild ride claw two cost and it, you know it blocks for three and because you're ko you are winning most of your clashes nobody in the format is favored in these clashes against you because you're running like 25 or or 22 or whatever attacks in your deck all of them are like six or seven attacks or maybe even eight when they're in your deck so um nobody's winning clashes against you so this gives you an agility and blocks for three it's just really really insane value of course there's always the downside that if you give the wrong deck the agility instead if you're facing a mirror for example this becomes much much uh, worse agile wind up red it's a three for seven and does the same thing as the blue uh bear fangs yellow is actually quite strong still it comes in for two for seven in the right deck and creates a, a might token so it's kind of a two for eight in a yellow, which then in a pinch pitches for another bear fangs or whatever, or a claw. Um, assault and battery blue. So this is this is kind of the core of the deck that you would, you know, you would want 12 of these cards in your deck. It blocks for three, it pitches for three, it hits for five, so it's uh, it counts as a six in your deck. And on, for example, turn zero, you have this in your hand and another blue, then you can create the agility and the might token on turn zero and be sure that you can get to start your next turn. Next turn strong without having to pop your flat trackers, for example. Uh, Wild Ride Yellow, also very strong in the right deck. It's, it's, uh, it's, this is especially strong in decks that haven't been able to pick up enough and agility creators because those go pretty high. Um, so this is kind of your insurance for not having enough agility is you pick enough five attacks and enough Wild Rides, and you can still go for that aggressive strategy if that's your that's your target. Of course, if you haven't been able to pick enough agility creators, the other thing you can do is, is uh, start picking more three blocks and, and three for sevens and go for the value plan. Agile wind up yellow, still pretty good in yellow. Um, Bonebreaker bellow, 
again allows you to use big hands quite efficiently because the beat chest is is relatively efficient sort of on rate when you create the might and you get the plus two uh, and it gives your claw go again so it even enables you to use five card hands quite well the downside is that it's not a six so it's going to be a whiff for your discards uh pack hunt red really good at finishing games and a two two cost six three block take it on the chin you get two value plus the agility token really really strong again the downside being that it's not a six itself so you don't want want to pack your deck too much with these and then you have some uh three block five attack blues as well as mighty wind up blue which gives your claw go again if you discard it on your turn so it in a pinch acts as a as kind of a mini agility um as well so how do you end up on ko for me at least the, the common way i've noticed is that of course there are you know a million ways to end up on ko but uh, because you want a, a pretty good number of five attacks in your deck you don't want it to happen too late necessarily but how i've often seen it happen is that you start the draft thinking that you want to stay open you for example see some agility creators so lead with speed wage agility or agile wind up red these are pretty good uh picks in the pick one to three range you're you're quite happy picking a three for seven a strong three for seven especially and you're always quite happy picking a lead with speed red or you can get a trade in probably you're not like first picking trade in red but you might be third picking trading red because it's it's actually quite strong in in uh kasai it's it's really strong in in reinar and it's it's completely fine in ko it's not great but it's it's fine um and even in the guardians you can kind of play it it's a it's a fine sort of you know mini go wide strategy so maybe you pick up cards like these early on and then you see a strong brute card around pick four or five this could be an assault and battery red this could be a pack hunt or a bone breaker bellow it could of course also be a a wild ride or a, or a bear fangs but uh in this example it's sort of like a, a hero agnostic one where you're just saying that okay maybe brute is open you see a couple of these in a row and you're like okay brute this brute seems to be open let, let's go for brute and then instead of finding reinar cards you start finding more ko cards late in, in in pack one which is actually kind of more often the case because uh reinar wants much more specific things it specifically wants sixes and then it want, wants certain cards like bone breaker bellows trade-ins etc um whereas with ko you just want the fives just want the fives that fulfill a few other conditions right you want the yellow bear fangs you want the blue pound towns you want the the yellow clash of agilities even um these are completely completely fine in your deck whereas out of these the, the you know reinar would really mainly want to just play pound town so that's a kind of a common way to end up on ko of course there's a million other ways you can first pick a wild ride if you're if you're a little more adventurous for example um or a, or a bear fangs which is probably even better and then then you can kind of start going on it early but i prefer staying open to some degree and then seeing some evidence that uh that brute is put this open so we talked about the two different builds of ko earlier on there's the aggressive deck with the wild rides and the bear fangs so sort of lots of non-blocks with constant pressure and then there's the more conservative more three blocking more three for seven type of deck so here's an example of an aggressive deck this is something i drafted myself where it has seven non-blocks in it with three bear fangs and, and four wild rides so you're you're gonna have a tough time if you lose the tempo a lot um so you want to be keeping tempo so that you can attack with these guys instead of having to block with the other cards in your hand and then being stuck with these and to enable these seven non-blocks that draw this card randomly um the deck has 24 attacks of five plus power so you shouldn't be missing on these especially if you have another another five attack in hand when you're when you play them it doesn't necessarily have as much agility creation as you would want it has smashback alehorn it has um well clash of agility and then the mighty wind-ups give you kind of a pseudo pseudo agility on one turn if you want and the assault and batteries are there for a pinch but they're mostly for like turn zero agility creation 
So it really relies on the wild rides. And this is a deck where a yellow wild ride really shines. You don't want it in all the builds necessarily that much, but this is this is where you want it, where you don't have enough agility. Yeah, you kind of you're not gonna get 30 sixes probably. So the rest of it you fill with you know the best cards you can get. So it's quite often it's you have to draft a few blues that are not six attacks. Here they're actually pretty strong. So talk a big game is a is a non-attack three block blue. Really, really versatile in that sense. Smashback Alehorn, of course, is always good with with raw meat and just an agility greater as well. Uh, despite blocking two, and then Rawhide Rumble is a block three blue. You're always, always, always happy with a block three blue in this format. And Rally the Rear Guard as well is, is kind of flexible with the zero blocks. Helps you block for, for five with two cards. And helps with attack reactions and, and overpowers and so on. And then you have Run Into Trouble. Really strong if you can, if, you know, if it happens to be active. Of course, in this particular deck, you don't have the agility token that often. So... So it's more, you know, more often not not active, and then bone break a pillow as a as a really strong red. If you want to be drafting the aggressive archetype, it's not necessarily looking exactly like this, but from from the the ratio of five attacks, you probably want to be looking at something like this. And then you would want to swap some of these cards for for agile wind ups, um, for lead with speeds, etc., to get more more agility. And then maybe in that case, you can start. Um, drafting a you know fewer yellow wild rides, so that's the aggressive deck. Next, let's look at the three block deck. And here's an example. This is not drafted by me. This is this is something uh, somebody posted online, where you can quite clearly see that it's it's built different, right? It has only two yellow bear fangs and it has only two wild rides. What it instead has is twenty one three blocks and two four blocks. So when you start to bring in these block cards, that's quite often a kind of a signal that your deck is a maybe not so much like a Bear Fangs Wild Ride deck, and it's more like a long-term value grind deck. You kind of you you also quite highly then value cards like Clash of Might Yellow, so it blocks for three, and more often than not gives you a Might token. So it also kind of blocks for four value. Um, so really strong as such, but. Um, but still, in a deck like this, you would probably want a good amount of bear fangs simply because of the value. Um, so you want to block with with a couple cards and then send a bear fangs for for eight plus one or or seven plus one. So pretty pretty good strategy to to stay ahead in the value game. So that's Kale. Next, let's talk about Reinar. Reinar, of course, is the classic hero from Welcome to Wraith. Four intellect, twenty health. It says, whenever you discard a card with six or more attack during an action phase, intimidate. And as you may notice, I've taken a bit of a break between the KO section and this Reinar section. And the reason is that I needed to draft more Reinar. And what did I learn drafting more Reinar? Well, I have a couple of redactions after it. Uh, first of all, what I said earlier is that Reinar is smack in the middle in this sort of two by two chart that we have, where he sort of wins halfway with value and halfway with evasion and then can spend big hands in sort of a middling in middling amounts because it, do, it doesn't have access to wild ride similar to ko but otherwise is you know is able to produce agility tokens etc however after playing reinar a little bit more optimally i would say uh in the past few days i've noticed that that reinar is actually pretty good at spending or, or using big hands if you draft him correctly. The reason is that even though you lose wild ride, you still of course have the same agility tokens. But what you have on top of that is mighty windups, agile windups in red and yellow, as well as trade in to maybe you know a lesser degree or maybe the same degree as KO, you have Bonebreaker Bellow. So these four cards, Bonebreaker Bellow, Trade In, Mighty Windup and Agile Windup, they almost always enable you to use your entire hand at least somewhat efficiently at, you know especially if you put some value on on intimidation so it's actually quite dangerous if you're below 10 life to give Reinar a five card hand because they can very easily come at you for for 50 with a with one or two or maybe even three intimidates in the in the craziest scenarios so that's one 
kind of a reduction to what I said earlier. Another one is that I said trade in is a B minus for Reinar. After having played the deck a little bit, I think it's I think the first trade in is a B plus. It is the preferred way to end the game is having having a trade in in Arsenal because it's super efficient. It's so efficient compared to the wind ups. Um, if you don't expect to take another turn in the game, then the wind ups they only give you an intimidate and your claws go again, which is absolutely fine. But what trade in does on top of that is three damage and drawing a card. It's, you know, as you can imagine, that smooths out many hands which otherwise wouldn't be able to go for the kill to actually go for the kill. So I think the first trade in is a B plus, but the, the value dwindles very, very quickly to a you know more in the B minus range if you get the the second or especially if, if you somehow manage to get the third one. Of course, you know, if you have a trade in, in Arsenal every turn and you play it every turn, that's it's also fine. It's probably relatively efficient with the deck. Um, so what does Reinar want to do? And you know, why do you draft Reinar? Well, well, Reinar has three strengths compared to KO. It has game-ending intimidate combo, so you're not only relying on burst damage and outvaluing your opponent. You can simply end the game on the spot when they're at sort of seven, eight, sometimes even nine life if you're really, really lucky. Um, you have two mandible claws instead of one, and they both get go again when you discard something uh, or when you discard a six. So that enables for very wide turns sometimes. And it also gives you a lot of flexibility because all it's all you need is blues, enough blues, and you have something to do on these wide turns, which is quite efficient. And you, of course, have the same on-rate brute cards that KO does, but you probably play fewer non-blocks. So you, you're a decent grindy deck. Of course, you miss the plus one on, on might on many turns, which is a huge downside. But uh, other than that, you're, you're still a pretty on-rate deck, which is, which is decently good in this format. As I said, the four cards that enable go again for claws, those are the key to this deck. Maybe not turn to turn, but especially the reason to play Reinar, right? The reason to play Reinar is that one turn kill from four, five, six, seven, eight life that is enabled by going super wide and intimidating at least once, often twice per turn. Basically, it's just these four cards that enable that. You have other options. You can, you can, you know, from an agility token, you can do all sorts of crazy things where you um, beat chest with a rawhide rumble, for example. So you can go rawhide rumble, uh, claw claw, uh, for a double intimidate twelve. That's absolutely fine, but the, but that's reliant on the agility token. These uh, these work by themselves. Of course, trading needs to be an arsenal, but other than that. Agile wind up, mighty wind up, both red and, and yellow. Trade in, in all the colors basically, but red is of course the most efficient. And bone breaker bellow again in all, all colors, but everything other than the red is I, I don't think is is usable for anything other than pitching and blocking. Um, they start to become so inefficient. Of course, if you're if you're killing them, then you don't care about how efficient you are. But in general, that's the the mentality when you're putting these in your deck is that you want the reds. Uh, you don't necessarily want the yellows. So if that's the that's the core, that's kind of the the reason you are playing Reinar is these four cards, because they enable you to do something that KO cannot do. Otherwise, you're just a bad KO deck. Um, then of course you should dra draft these pretty highly, but in addition you should do something else. So what does Reinar want? It wants loads of blues, loads and loads of blues, because all of these big turns, they 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 require two claws, or you know, often they require two claws and and an attack on top. So you want two blues on all your big turns, and of course you want three blocks, as many as possible in your blues, because if you have many blues, then before you're killing them, you're blocking with many of them. So you really want optimally more than half of your blues to be three blocks. You want pack hunts. And you want rawhide rumbles. Of course, rawhide rumbles are kind of the poor man's pack hunt in, in some sense. But uh, you want especially pack hunts. Red pack hunts, they are absolutely key because um, usually one intimidate is fine, but a double intimidate is, you know, it can be backbreaking. And pack hunt 
is the way that you enable these double intimidate turns. Uh, you also want six power attacks, of course, preferably three block, uh, two for sixes or three for sevens. And you probably want some kind of a mix, um, but you at least want some amount of two for sixes because of that claw, claw, two for six finisher play, which doesn't really work with a three for seven and you don't have access to bigger tokens. So you need some amount of these two for sixes, but early in the game, you'd prefer the three for seven so you can block with a couple cards, hit them, hit them for seven, um, and keep on grinding that early game. And then you want agility creation. Um, maybe not always in the same amounts as, as KO does, but, but it's still very, very valuable for you. So what are the downsides of Reinar versus KO? Well, first of all, you want many of the same cards. So you're fighting for a relatively similar card pool. And that means that you cannot just, you know, if there are three KOs in the pod, you're going to have a bad time being a Reinar. But if there are two KOs in the pod, you might be better off being the lone Reinar than being the third KO. So that's kind of how I, how I see it currently. Or, or you lose a lot of value because you don't have the might ability. So early on in the game, when you're intimidating, instead of gaining plus one, you're almost losing one value. There are some edge cases. Like if you hit a block card with your Intimidate, then you're crazy lucky. Uh, but that that's, of course, hugely valuable if they have to pitch that that uh, red now. Um, and versus Guardian, it can sometimes be pretty useful to Intimidate early on in the game as well. But other than that, you mainly have like a very late game ability. Chaos ability is on all the time, except you know during the very last turn when, when you don't benefit anymore from the Might. And that's kind of the bridge to the next point. The in intimidate is is you know it gets strong in the late game. It doesn't doesn't do very much early on. So you get these moments playing Reinar that you draw this dream hand, which you look at it and you say, oh my god, I can do 15 damage with two or three intimidates with this with this hand. And then you're like, okay, so what am I achieving with that? They will probably take 12 damage or something. And then they will hit me back for 15 because they have the agility and the and the might or whatever and and they're ready to go. So so it's um it's a it's a really frustrating deck sometimes because you you draw the kill hand at the wrong time, which of course means you need to put in enough of the kill hands in your deck. And what's also a downside is that two claws require four four to five card hands to use beneficially. And if you're not using two claws ever then you're just a really bad KO. So of course you don't need to use them every turn. You don't need to use them every other turn. But probably a couple times per game, you, you should probably benefit from having two claws and that requires big hands. Um, so that can be sometimes problematic when you're presented with on hits and so on. So as a result of all of these downsides, Reiner is actually winning very few pods. I did some research. I, I looked up online for 3-0 decks that people have posted. I found 200 3-0 decks. And out of these 200, I found seven Reinars. So that's something like three, three and a half percent of, of pod winning. So what does that mean? Does it mean that Reinar is absolutely the worst hero? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It can also mean that it's very, very unintuitive to draft. And KO is super intuitive to draft. So people are just going for the easy option. They're drafting KO. Nobody's bothering researching Reinar. Uh, it could mean that, but I think it probably means a little bit of both. So what do your optimal hands and play patterns look like as Reinar? And these are these are more in the kill hand territory, the, the examples that I'll show you in the next couple of pages. Um, what you actually want to be doing early on in the game is grinding. So you want to block some, attack some. Um, if you have an agility, you want to, want to use a bigger hand. If you don't have an agility, you want to block more. You want a lot of these three for sevens. Etc. Where you can grind the grind the game to a point when, let's say, you're at 11 life and your opponent is at 14 life, and it's your turn, you're attacking them for for seven or something. And they look at their hand and they go, okay, I I'm just gonna take this, I'm gonna go to seven, and I'll hit you for so much with this hand because it you know blocks poorly and attacks really well. So they'll take the seven, and then they'll attack you for some amount. 
And hopefully you can cover that with your equipment. So you barely stay alive. And then you hope that you draw your kill hand. Of course, you draw the hand before you, you need to block. So you can kind of decide whether that's your kill hand or whether you block the turn and wait for another one. Um, that's also fine. But you probably, you know, given how well um, decks attack in this format and given how poorly decks block, you probably don't have too many turns to wait for that kill hand, which means your deck consistency is absolutely key. So let's look at what that kill hand then looks like once you've gotten to this dream scenario of, you know, they're at seven and you're at 11 and they're, they've attacked you for for 12 and you cover it with your your um, equipment and you go to one or two and and then you want to kill them. So how do you do that? Well, here's an example of of a dream hand. You have Agile wind up yellow, pack hunt red, any blue is fine. And then you have any six power. I've just put in rawhide rumble and assault and battery here just to again get you in the mindset of, of what are the what are the good cards for the deck. But um, any blue and any six. So you start and you, of course you have trade in in Arsenal because you parked that there a couple of turns ago, knowing that the skill hand would be would be coming. So what do you do? You you play the trade in and discard the the six, the assault and battery in this case. And then you have some optionality. Did you draw a blue or did you draw a red or yellow? So if you drew a blue, you have the additional benefit of discarding the agile windup for a second intimidate. The trade-in, of course, uh, gave you the first intimidate. The agile windup gives you the second intimidate. And then you come in for claw, claw, pack hunt for a third intimidate. And this is a, a five card 15 with, with three intimidates. If you didn't draw a blue, if you draw a red or a yellow, you just go claw, claw, pack hunt for for a five card 15, but just with two intimidates. They're still very, very dead. Of course, if your assault and battery is blue, you can, and maybe you, you don't know if you're killing them or not with this hand, then you can instead discard the agile wind up to the trade in. Because then you know you already have the blue, blue plus pack hunt, which is which is the dream, dream three card setup here. Um, and then that Agile windup turns into a potential Arsenal card. So it's actually a four card 15 at that point because you get to get to Arsenal another card if the game goes on. Um, so this is kind of the dream you're looking for. And this is why trade-in is such a, such a super powerful card because as you can see next, many of the other kill turns, they, they probably don't come in for as much damage, damage and as many intimidates. But let's look at some other options or other, other examples. The one up top here is a is a as an example of a four card twelve with double intimidate plus the agility token, which is basically just the previous hand but with two blues. So you discard the agile wind up, you go claw claw pack hunt, two intimidates, twelve damage, and you have an agility next turn. It could be a mighty wind up as well, of course, if 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 you want, and then then you have a might next turn. A very strong strong hand in this um, this format. And the below one is an is an example of how you use Bonebreaker Bellow. So Bonebreaker Bellow, the problem with the card is that it costs one. And it that completely messes up your claw claw attack. You're basically shut out unless somehow your you know opponent gives you a vigor token. You're shut out from playing Bonebreaker Bellow, beating chest, claw claw, you know, two cost. Because there are no one costs in the format. So that bone, bone breaker bellow one cost is, is extremely annoying, <laughs> to be honest. But that just means that you need to play it a little bit differently, right? Where you, for example, here you pitch the blue, you play the bellow, you discard the assault and battery uh, to the beat chest. So that's plus five. Then you pitch the, the cracked bobble, <laughs> which is, of course, not in your dream hand, but any yellow will do or any blue will do to, to come in with a claw for eight. And then you attack with the pack hunt for uh, for six. Uh, actually, you, yeah, you need to. You don't need to pitch the crack bubble yet, but you pitch the the bubble for the pack hunt. So that's fourteen with double intimidate. Still extremely strong with the bone breaker bellow, but but you lose a little tiny bit of that upside, and you also lose a little bit of that flexibility that trade in gave you, where you had these options of if you draw a, a red or a blue or whatever. You can get to Arsenal a card and so on. 
So what kind of cards do you want as a result in your deck? Well, first of all, I took a look at those seven 3-0 Rhinars, and I did a bit of analysis. And here's the frequency analysis of reds and yellows found in those seven 3-0 Rhinar decks. So as you would expect, number one, you have Pack Hunt. This is uh, you know, very much the core of the deck. It's one of the cards that you know both KO and, and Reinar want, but Reinar really appreciates it, uh, you know, that little bit more. Um, then you have Mighty Windup, and I think Mighty Windup is here instead of Agile Windup because Agile Windup is just much harder to get. Everybody else wants it to, as well. But uh, Yellow Mighty Windup is is not that much on anyone else's radar except a little bit on, on KOs. You have Assault and Battery, Bonebreaker Bellow, Agile Windup, Bear Fangs, which is a a little bit surprising, but I think it's 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 a strong card and and uh, it's a two for six, so it's not the end of the world if you miss, right? So completely fine. I just personally don't want a lot of non-blocks in my in my Reinar decks, and also it's it's gonna miss more often than not, right? You probably you're not not gonna have twenty twenty sixes ever. Um, Pound Town Rising Power, Rising Power Red is actually pretty good. It's a six that after trading attacks for seven on two resources. So it's a instead of playing a pack hunt out of those combos earlier, you could play a rising power uh, from the trade-in, and that's completely fine. Uh, lead with power, wage might, etc. etc. The surprising thing for me is that trade-in had only four copies in these decks. And when I've been playing Reinar, Reinar I have really, really loved that card. Uh, especially the first copy, as I said. So so I'm I'm gonna, you know, have a hot or a medium hot take and say that that should be more often in these decks. So as a result of all the information here, what do we actually want to pick in our decks? So here are the top commons and rares for Reinar. Um, and I've split them up into a few categories. So first of all, of course, you have the double claw enablers. These are pretty often what you should be picking above most other things, especially the first trading. Again, don't don't pick the third trade in like crazy, right? But the first one, really powerful. The first one or two bone breaker bellows, really, really strong. And the, the wind ups you probably want as many as you can get your hands on. Then you have the top attacks. Out of these, I would say that in the A minus to B range, you have pack hunt, rawhide rumble, assault and battery, and wage agility. I think these are the for me the premium premium attacks. And then a little bit below those at the sort of B minus to, to high C plus range, you have cards like Wage Might, Clash of Agility, Clash of Might, Pack Call, Pound Town, Beast Mode. It's you know it looks like very much like a Reinar card, but the three cost makes it a little bit clunky. Um, Rising Power is actually pretty good, as I said, and Rally the Rear Guard is is decently flexible. So these you know three for sevens. Or two for sixes that block three, or in rising powers case a two for seven sometimes. They're they're pretty good. You want your deck to to be filled with these. And then the rest of the core of the deck is made up of some key equipment. So you have flat trackers and monstrous veil here at the top, and then gauntlet of might and raw meat, more toward uh, the B minus to C plus range. What you also want to want is as many blue block threes as you can get your hands on. The best ones are probably Pack Hunt and Down But Not Out. But then the Rawhide Rumbles, the Clash of Mites, the Assault and Batteries come, come pretty close. And then, of course, you need to fill it with the two blocks later on. So that's just a must. None of the blues are sixes in this format, so you don't need to you know, pick and find the, the absolutely right ones for Reinar. The right ones for Reinar are ones that block three. Lead with speed, I've put up here, but take this uh, a little bit carefully, right? Because as you'll soon notice when we talk about the ratios, you don't have a lot of space for non blues, non sixes. You have maybe like four slots in your deck, and you would ra rather have those four slots be trade ins and bone breaker bellows. Lead with speed, fantastic card, put it in your deck, you know, completely fine, but don't take, you know, the second yellow one of these or anything like that, right? It's You don't want the yellow lead with speed. That's horrible. And then once you have all of this put together, you try to fill the rest with sixes. So here towards the, 
the bottom right, you have cards like Pound Town, Assault and Battery, Pack Call, Yellow. Very good cards in the deck. Again, you want your, your yellow sixes to block for three if possible at all. If not possible, then you take the Wage Mites and whatever. That's, that's fine. Uh, as many of them should block for, for six, uh, three as possible. So how do you end up on Rhinar? It's kind of like, I've noticed this, it's kind of like how you end up on Kale. Um, so you take your generics early on, and maybe you've picked one or two agility creators because those those tend to maybe be rated a little bit higher than the Vigor and, and uh, Might creators. So you start taking those pretty early, like uh, an Agile wind-up or a trade-in wage agility. You take cards like that in the first two or three picks. Then you see a strong Brute card somewhere in, in you know pick three or four or five. Pick a Pack Hunt or a Bonebreaker Bellow or Assault and Battery or something like that. So, so, so far, it's basically the same as KO. But the difference is that instead of seeing those KO cards in the mid pack one, late pack one, like a yellow wild ride or a yellow bear fangs or something like that, or some of these blue fives or or even yellow five block threes that are that are really relevant, like Clash of Agility is for KO. Uh, you start seeing these Reinar cards. You see a yellow mighty wind up that nobody has picked up. You see a blue pack hunt, a red rawhide rumble. KO kind of looks at and, and doesn't see anything special, or a yellow assault and battery later on in the pack. So you you pick a few of these and then you start to notice that maybe actually I already have an agile wind up and a mighty wind up in my deck. I already have a trade in in my deck, and I have a pack hunt in my deck. So this is a really really strong Reinar core, and you decide to go down that route instead. And where do you then end up if you go down that route? Well, here's an example of a target. Reinar deck. This is an actual deck that I drafted. Um, it didn't trio, unfortunately. I met a, a very, very crazy Olympia in the finals and, and lost that one. But the first two games, the, the deck worked like a charm, really. You know, it, it, was, it was beautiful. And what made it beautiful is, is the ratios. I had eight of these double claw enablers, so three agile windups two trade-ins, two bone breaker bellows, and a mighty windup. I think in the in the version I played, I, I actually had like a third trade-in and a third bone breaker bellow instead of the two wage mites here. But after those games I realized that I should have just cut the third trade-in and the third bone breaker bellow and put in these wage mites because I didn't have enough sixes and that that came back to bite me a couple times. Um, but anyway I had eight of these double claw enablers I had 13, or I had access to, if I was smart enough to put them in, access to 13 attacks of 6+. plus, And I had 13 blues. So this is kind of the, for me, the, the formula how you build Reinar. And then, of course, you know, what's a big part of the formula is as many block threes as possible. And if you skim through the deck here, you see that there's a lot of block threes here. But, you know, could be even more, right? You don't necessarily need uh, the adrenaline rush blue or the bear fangs blue, right? You you know, but th those are just the blues that I happened to get when I was when I was lacking them. Rising power blue, on the other hand, is it was surprisingly good. You could on these trade in turns, you could attack for five if you happen to be like very blue rich in that hand. So it's kind of like a very very poor man's pack hunt. But yeah, this is to me the formula. This is what you're aiming for, and what you don't need to fight for are the blue wind-ups that KO really wants, for example. And you don't need to fight for the wild rides, and you don't need to fight for the bear fangs. And you can put in a, a red bear fangs here. That's completely fine. But uh, I'd rather have any block three, two for six. So that was Reinar. Next, let's quickly talk about brute ratios. So, so what are the ratios you want in your brute decks? We had two builds of KO that we discussed earlier. We had sort of this aggro KO, that really prioritizes wild rides and, and bear fangs and has a lot of these draw discard random effects where you want to make sure you always hit. And then you have the value KO, which prioritizes three blocks much more. Still plays bear fangs very happily because it's such high value, but um, it doesn't necessarily hit every time. That's kind of a, the difference here. You, you have prioritized three blocks much more than you prioritized 
necessarily all having all all five attacks in your deck. And then you have Reinar, the one we just discussed. So what the aggro KO wants is is probably like 23 plus of these six attacks. And by six attacks, I mean, of course, five attacks. You'd really like to have like 25, but 23 is serviceable. You want to maximize your agility token creation, and you want to maximize your wild rides, especially if you don't have enough agility, then you really need to up your wild ride count. And you want probably 12, 13, maybe even 14 blues in some cases. Uh, and the good t- thing with KO is that you can play your fives as blues. So it's easy to kind of fill these conditions at the same time. With the value KO, it's a kind of a different story. You want to maximize your two card sevens or two card seven pluses. Bear Fangs is, of course, a two card nine if it hits, in a sense. You want to maximize your three and your four blocks. So you want to be putting in things like, uh, you know, test of strength or test of agility in there. And then you also want want your blues, your maybe 12, 13 blues, something like that. You might not need as many blues actually as the aggro KO because you're probably not going to have as many of these, you know, attack plus claw plus attack turns. But still, the way to lose in this format is to draw four reds. So you always want to make sure you have a good chunk of blues, especially if many of them block three, then why not? You know, you can play play a few extra. And Reinar, you know, as I said, you want 13 plus six attacks, 13 plus blues, something like 13 to 15 blues probably. And then you want uh, at least six of these double claw enablers probably. And of course, you the mighty windups and the agile windups, they do double duty in being six attacks and, and double claw enablers. Brute very much as the CC players know, is a ratio deck. You need to be very picky with you, with the cards you pick. So you can't just randomly go ahead hunting stuff that isn't the six attack and isn't the blue and isn't the Brock three or you know whatever whatever is in the core of your game plan. So be very picky with your ratios. Finally, I have a uh, brute majestics that I wanted to talk about very very quickly. I haven't played with all of these, so this is me theorizing some of it, but I played with some of them. Scent packing. This is of course very much a Reinar bomb because it's a yellow six which is uh, very much what you want to fill your deck anyway with. KO, it's probably still really good. You might, It might be like relatively easy for the opponent to block it. And it's pro- unlikely to come after a huge turn uh, like it is for, for, for Reinar. So maybe it's slightly worse theoretically, but um, let me know if I'm wrong. I haven't played with this card. Show No Mercy is, I think, kind of a B, and that might be... That might be too high even for Reinar. I have played with this card. I was not impressed. I think I blocked with it or discarded it every time. Mostly probably discarded it. And why is it not great? It costs three. Pack Hunt costs two. It enables that Claw Claw Pack Hunt play. This is kind of like a Pack Hunt, but with the very special edge case, if they somehow block with all their cards or they get intimidated, then then this gets plus three. It's very unlikely to happen because you cannot build this into a, a huge turn, similar to how you can do with Pack Hunt. So I think it's kind of like a slightly worse Pack Hunt, with some, with some upside in some very specific scenarios at the, at the end of the game. Cast Bones, great KO card. I had two of these in one of my three OKO decks, but I never played either of them. <laughs> my deck was, was good enough on its own that I, I never felt like I had the time, so I just rather, you know, attack them with the second attack. But um, I think it's still pretty crazy if you have like 25 sixes or fives. Especially if you draw at turn zero, then you probably won the game on the spot almost. Um, For Reinar, it's much less good because you probably have like 12, 13, 14, maybe 15, six attacks. So this gives you two or three mites and cost an action point. But it's a block three non-attack, which is fine. But Reinar doesn't really have a lot of space for non-blues that do that, so I put it as C minus. Show no mercy. I think it's a C plus mainly for for being a non-attack blue block three. But uh, again, it's not a five attack, so you don't have infinite space for these kind of you know mopey cards in your deck. I guess you could use it in a pinch, like if you draw a five card hand and you have this in there, and this is the only way you can sort of get lethal out of that hand, for example, which you need to do in order to prevent yourself from dying, then sure, you can play it, but I would recommend pitching and blocking with it. Finally, you have No Fear. I think this is a D 
decent card in KO. Again, it's not one of the it's not doing any of the core things that the deck is trying to do. So I wouldn't give it much more than a C plus. But you park this in Arsenal, it can be pretty high value. It can block for like five or six. Of course, preventing any other blocks that turn, which is which can be a problem. But um but the, that of course is a very very strong scenario if it works out for you. For Reiner, I think this is useless. It's like a D plus. It's kind of like cast bones where it's not doing any of the things your your deck is trying to do and it's screwing up your ratios. But on top of that, it's in a very clunky way, probably blocking three or maybe four. And it doesn't like have any other modes. It's just the mode is to block three or four in a clunky way. That's it. That's for this episode. Thank you for watching. Um, I will see you in the next episode where we talk about Guardian.